It's just going to be fun. Hey, friends. I'm Scott Hanselman, and I'm here with Dr. David Kellerman. He's a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales. Did I get that right? That's right, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. I thought that I had the coolest use of LEDs in an office, and I have been once again one-upped by you. This is a beautiful space that you've put together here. Thank you very much. Yes, this is my <laughs> home office. Um, I also co-own this with my six-year-old. So um, luckily for me, he's got a great collection of Lego and other things that actually work pretty well in the space. That's lovely. I also have a collection of Lego. It's a library and the children just show up and they check it out like a book and then they, <laughs> they leave. <laughs> so in the interest of the topic of computer stuff that they didn't teach you in school, which is the kind of the theme of my YouTube channel, uh, I, I, I like to talk about different things. Now, I'm a programmer. You are not a programmer. What is your specialty? What is your PhD? Yeah, so I'm like a knuckle-dragging mechanical engineer, which is funny because a lot of people don't really fully get what mechanical engineers are, but we're just people who turn the world into mathematics and then use it to model it and predict the future. So it's a very generic discipline. It's not to do with cars or engines. It's just to do with mechanics, which could be magnetism or thermodynamics, or it could be light or stress and strain or deformation mm. or modeling of machines and systems and processes. So I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I did a PhD in computational mechanics. Mm -hmm. And computational mechanics is the field where we take a material and we model the way that it responds to force or deformation. We turn it into maths and then we create complex computer software that is able to simulate what's going to happen. Mm. A great example is a bridge. We don't build a bridge, roll a truck and see whether it falls down. We want to model it before we ever start building it. And so we completely simulate everything now that we manufacture and create in computers, and we test first whether it's strong enough before we start making it. And this is the field of computational mechanics. Interesting. So my 14, soon to be 15 year old, just started uh, high school physics. I think it'd be form one uh, physics, where he just started out. And he's always impressed with the idea that physics in his mind predicts the future. He takes the little car, he puts it on the ramp, they calculate it and it says it'll take this many seconds to go down. And it go, and it, and it, and it's like, and it did what it said it would do. And he thinks that's amazing. Yep. Are you saying that you can like, say that this bridge will stand or this iPhone won't bend when the, it be, and, and then it happens yep. in reality. So the simulations really do reflect reality because the numbers work. Yep. Yeah, and for the viewers, I recommend if you're in YouTube now, you know, open another tab and search for crash worthiness analysis. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna see something mind blowing, which is that when we design a new car, we virtually crash the computer, the, the car on the computer into a wall, every crumple, the airbag going off, the person hitting the airbag. And then they do the ANCAP tests two years later when the car's actually in production. And you put the images side by side and it is absolutely mind boggling. Every crease in the metal, everything, wow. it's, it's perfection. And it's mind blowing. So that's computational mechanics, that's what we do. Okay, so the goal of my YouTube is to teach people and the goal of you now as a remote lecturer, I assume that you all are doing a lot of your things remote on Teams, is to teach people. But I have felt very constrained by this square. Uh, you know, I'm limited to the pixels that I can put in here, you know, so I, I try different camera angles and I try different, different things. I've tried it in, in different talks that I've given as well. You, you do similar things. Yeah, I do. And, you know, we could rewind the clock back to March when that's when our university went in, you know, the whole of Australia basically went into lockdown because of COVID-19. And I had an upcoming class that I was going to teach. My classes are three to 500 students. And I had a few weeks prep time. So a year before that, May 2019, I presented at Build, mm -hmm. and I was talking about bot framework for teams in the, in the talk that I gave. 
And Build came around and I thought, I want to see what Microsoft do because that was one of the first big conferences out of the gate that had to rapidly switch to online. And I thought, I want to see what these clever folks did. And that's how I got to know how you are because you did a keynote called Every Programmer is Welcome. And you made a really nice scene. It was very, I'm sure you probably look at it now and go, it was pretty basic. But it was the idea of, of using all of that real estate, of, of having a more, you know, humanistic kind of experience, not just PowerPoint karaoke or his little box in the corner. And so it got me to thinking about how I could do teaching better once I started. And, you know, like you said, we're stuck in this box all the time. And, you know, for people watching, you've probably got a Zoom call or two today and you'll have these meetings and people will be talking like this. And what they're actually doing is they're gesturing down here, but you can't see any of that and you lose that. And then then they do this thing where they share a PowerPoint and they talk over the top of it, but they can't do the simplest thing like point at something. Mm -hmm. And so we do this weird, awkward jiggling of the mouse over different parts of the screen. Mm -hmm. It's awful. Anyway, I, Even I, if I, I wanted to show you something on my screen, right? Like I would be, yeah. uh, I've got this lovely high definition camera. People compliment me on my camera. But as soon as I go like this, uh, yeah. well, you can't, well, how can I, how do I get this here? I just want to, if, if you were standing there, you feel like you're standing there. Your head is the right size. Can't yeah. you see that? It's very frustrating and don't even start on paper. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so so the first thing I did was I shot an email to my friends over at Surface and I said, could you send me one of these? Surface <laughs> it's Hub good to have to friends. Wears. It is good to have friends. And I thought what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to point to stuff on the screen physically and then flip over to screen sharing. And, of mm. course, Teams is really great. T Teams is ahead of Zoom and, and other things in that you can join the meeting as one person from multiple devices and it won't switch the mic on for everyone and it won't broadcast your own voice back at you, mm -hmm. which is a really tricky thing. And so I thought, okay, well, I could join from this device and I can set a Hanselman style scene and how do I do that? Okay, so you put power toys on mm -hmm. and you've got fancy zones and you want PowerPoint to fill up part of the screen mm -hmm. so that you can still have your camera and other things composed. But something funny happens with PowerPoint is when you make it open to that box, you can't ink on it anymore. Mm. You won't do annotations. So this, st this started me on my whole problem solving where I built the system. We can, de we can demo it now. So yeah, yeah. I'll walk over and here. And while you're doing that, I want to give sure context we, we, to people. Hang on. So we're in a Teams yeah. call now. And yeah. I can pick you up and, and I can move you around because I'm compositing this. But now, yeah. if I go over here now, look, how, how are you in two places at once? What's happening here? Yeah, actually, I'm in three places at once because I've got another computer here and I'm using this computer for chat. And, you know, chat might not be meaningful for people who are watching this right now because the chat's between me mm -hmm. and Scott. But actually, I think our chat is really important. So I can do magic like that. And I just docked the chat and I put a bit of a Thanksgiving turkey. So happy Thanksgiving <laughs> to everyone in the US. And now what I have is I've got my scene here. I've got my OneNote. I can have my PowerPoint, you know, over here mm -hmm. in full in full screen. Oops, sorry, I can do the right one. Okay, I've got my PowerPoint, and because it's full screen, I can do all of my ink annotations, mm -hmm. and I can go between scene here, okay, maybe we're talking about the Harbour Bridge, maybe we're going to turn it into a 3D model, mm. do a morph effect, let's do some maths, okay. We jump over here, and we're going to do some hardcore mathematics at this point, where I'm going to start writing. That's pretty good, right? Like you can read what I'm writing here. I can mostly read it. I mean, I can getting... zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I can pretty much see that. Yeah, it's not too bad. But as I'm talking here, maybe actually what I want to do is I want to screen share. Oh, and wow. so now I'm writing it, and you've got a really good close feed of exactly what I'm doing. And that's amazing. now I want to do a worked example. And so you see, I've got a link yeah. here. I'm going to jump over I see. to my OneNote. 
Now, it's going to take me to the, the same example mm -hmm. that I'm going to solve. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start solving this problem with Digital Ink, right? And have you noticed now you're, you're looking at my back? Mm -hmm. It's like spitballing the professor <laughs> in the classroom. <laughs> so I'm going to do another bit of magic. And hey, now I'm on a different camera. So I'm looking at the camera. I'm doing digital inking up here, you know, maybe I'm, I'll, I'll use some ink to shape here. I'm going to draw a rectangle, All right? We're going to highlight that, okay? We've got a new beam that we're drawing. And to my left down here, I'm watching the meeting and you can write something in the chat. I'm going to write, hey, over here. And you see that the hey that I just wrote is there in the chat. And so I'm watching my students. So my student, Scott, has said, cool. And Scott might say, hey, well, you know, you're calculating this beam, but where does the maximum deflection occur? So I'll go, yeah, great question, Scott. It actually doesn't occur where the load is applied. It occurs right here where the gradient of the beam is zero. And so then we go off and we do a whole calculation and we go through a whole bunch of maths, 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 maths. And then we get here and I say, isn't that interesting? We actually predict that even though the load is here, that the max deflection is here. Wow. And so then this is what I love about layering digital and physical is I can put an actual beam in front of it and I can say, look, when we apply the force here, the deflection occurs further over. And we are compositing layers of physical, digital, physical, and digital on one another. And our communication is getting better and better. Mm. So this is the whole kind of principle. We get to the end of the lecture and I say, that's it. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next week. And then boom, you're outside of the lecture theater. And so you can see I can do all of this kind of magic almost as if I've got a producer, but I don't. I've got a remote in my left hand. Mm. A lot of people are using Stream Deck, but you've got a wire. You've got a USB cable to press those little buttons. I just got a Logitech remote, and I just set all of the keys to switch between the scenes in XSplit mm -hmm. as hotkeys, and you can remap them and do whatever you want. So I just kind of click a button, and I'm just talking, and I'm producing and I'm switching scene between different things like this, and it's become second nature to me now while I have these classes. Interesting. Now, for folks that are watching this, they may know a bit, notice a bit of an audio lag. That's because of the way I have been able to composite this into, into OBS, so that's certainly not your fault. I just want to make sure that folks know that if you're out of sync just a tiny little bit, it's because I am pulling a Teams meeting out, compositing this into OBS, and bringing it back into YouTube as well. I'll try to fix that a little bit in post. You're off by about 100 milliseconds, but that's not how it works. It's very live. This is live and crisp, and you're basically a, pro a TV producer, and it's very organic. Yeah, it doesn't feel funny. like there's a lot of friction here. No, it's not, and you know, you 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 did a, a podcast recently. It's on your YouTube channel, and it's about being intentional, mm. right? And what I love is that I sit at my desk and I work, and then I get up to have a meeting or a class, and I'm being intentional here. I'm in a I'm in a different space, and this space where I can gesture and talk and control my screen is completely around that function. I move between different places depending on what I'm doing during the day in my home office. And this is, it's making me feel more focused. It's much more natural. You know, in the office, we all get up from our desk and we walk over to a meeting room and we have a meeting and then the meeting ends and we get up and we walk back to our desk and it's very intentional. And we've lost all of that with work from home. We just sit on this one chair mm -hmm. all day, eating our lunch, having a meeting, being productive, we don't move from that space. Um, recently, I added the lavalier mic that you have as well. And even though I've got a headphones on right now, being able to simply move around your personal space and still be heard is yeah. a surprising, a yeah. surprising gift. I think a webcam with a wider, a wider lens is a gift as well. And you've got both that that tight shot right now, and then the wider lens as well. One of the things, yeah, and the, you know the the camera I'm using here, by the way is a Sigma FP. This is a full frame uh, camera that when you plug USB in, it pretends that it's a webcam. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the amazing things that this camera can do is it can, you can see my face is well resolved and the screen is well resolved. And then I can switch completely to a very dark scene like this. And we've still got a really good match between these. And this is called dynamic range. And it's one thing that this camera does really well that most webcams don't do. That is so of. interesting. In fact, one of the things, let me take my headphones on and show you something. One of the things that I've been struggling with for a while, Alexa, turn off the office beam, is I picked up a Samsung art frame, which looks great over here in, oh, yeah. uh, in this darkness because it is very, very dim. But once I turn the picture on, it becomes so bright that it fights with things. So having a camera that can be presented in such a way that uh, you can see a screen and not have to mess with the contrast and the brightness is really, really challenging. Yeah. And you know, another thing that I did actually, is I don't have it turned on now, but these Philips lights are all synced to this screen. Mm -hmm. And so when I change this, scene from something light to dark, the room light as well changes and it helps keep a really nice contrast balance. Okay. So I'm going to stop. I'll stop screen sharing this. Oh, I can show you one other thing quickly while I'm here is, um, I'm going to jump over again here. I'm actually, I'm, I'm joining this meeting three times over Teams, <laughs> but this is another thing I do, which is augmented reality. This is our lab space mm -hmm. and this is in Teams. This is in SharePoint spaces. And my students couldn't come to the lab anymore. And so we're talking about beam deflection and stuff. And so we just, we took a 3D bubble shot of our laboratory. And then the assignment, which is in SharePoint, it's actually a SharePoint document right here. And then we used Azure Connect and we digitized the rig here, which is a, it's a momentum rig, mm -hmm. right? And then we animated it using ubiquity and now the students can actually take the measurements of the momentum of this rig in an augmented reality space so instead of just sitting there passively watching a video they're immersed in the lab space and they're taking the actual measurements from a 3d digitization of the actual experimental rig mm. and so it's interesting right how we can bring the students back into the physical space even though they can't be on campus. You're in Teams right there. What are you inside of? Are you in a web VR uh, link? No, no, this is SharePoint Spaces. This is native. This is, it's in private preview. I worked with the SharePoint Spaces folks. Oh, wow. But literally this is a SharePoint page and it's stored in the team site. Oh my goodness. And so if you go into SharePoint Spaces, you go into options, mm -hmm and you'll be able to enable this thing called SharePoint Spaces, and you can just bring in your 3D objects that you have straight into that SharePoint space. It's pretty wow. cool. Wow. Let's, uh, let's sit down and talk about, yeah. let's talk about the, the intentionality of this, and also I think that it's possible that one could look at this, who's made it, what, 15, 20 minutes into our little chat here, and they could start being dismissive. They could say, well, he's got a doctorate. You know, he's a fancy, he must be a fancy computer person. But you said before, this is, you're not a programmer. You're enthusiastic about technology. How do we bridge that gap? How do you make it seem like this is possible for an eighth grade English teacher and not just, uh, a, you know, a mechanical engineer? Yeah. And I, well, I think this is where engineering comes in because engineering is about taking the art of the possible and democratizing it, about turning it into something that everybody can use. You know, we, we pick up our phones and we have all of this technology and, and GPS and amazing stuff in our pockets. We get in our cars, we have all of this incredible technology. It's the job of the engineer to improve the quality of life of humanity by taking complex systems and turning them into scalable things. Now, mm -hmm. I think you can take systems like this and build them all in to Teams or Zoom or Google Meet or whatever you want and just have buttons. You know, you, you wiggle your mouse and you get a couple of controls. Like right? right now we can change who we're spotlighting or mm -hmm. whatever. We can just compose these different scenes. So I think that we can come a long way. There is also hardware. I mean, this Surface Hub 
is an expensive piece of equipment. Indeed. But I actually spoke to the folks at Microsoft and I said, do you know what it costs to give your employees an office for one year? And, <laughs> and the guy said to me, actually, I know the number. It's $9,000 per year. To give and you a I little said, space, is, a little cubicle. To give you a cubicle. I'm like, what does this cost? And he's like, $9,000. So one year amortization. You, you, if you've got employees working from home, we don't think... Let's set up our employees at home with mm -hmm. equipment that's going to make them more productive. It's healthy for me to stand yeah. up. It's good practice for me to break my routine. We don't think about this. It's funny that you mention that because I'm on a personal machine right now. There's a big discussion about, you know, a lot of us were told in, in March, grab your laptops and run. And, you know, a lot of people are running on personal machines. They're underpowered. But there's so many opportunities. Like you have a, a $9,000 touchscreen, but I've got a small dual screen touch screen but the sure. amount of the amount of machination it would require me to get yeah. this here to there like i'd like to be able to just go oh hey let me just join click hey look Boom. watch and i can start scribbling with my you know my little stylus or whatever i don't need i could use a, an ipad i could use an android tablet that like that microsoft whiteboard i think uh, tries to to accomplish that as well. So yeah. you're imagining a world where what you just showed us, which you put together with a lot of Lego pieces, a lot of technology Lego pieces, would become a use case that yeah. everyone yeah. anyone would be able to do. Plug in a oh. webcam and camera one, camera two. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm looking at a 28-inch monitor right now. I've got a phone that's got Teams on it. I'm imagining I hit join from Teams. I make this my camera. And I point it so it's looking at me and the screen. And now I'm mm. pointing mm -hmm. at you. And this this happened with technology we've already got on our desk. Mm. And have you found that the students that you work with are far more engaged than just sitting in a giant grid of people and screen sharing? Yeah, they love it. There's this really amazing thing where I gave my students an activity. So I said, okay. Here's a mechanism. I want you to draw the free body diagram. That's an engineering thing, right? Where you remove it from its environment and you replace the environment with forces. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a piece of paper, scribble it down in front of you, solve the free body diagram, take a photo, post it to the Teams chat. Hmm. And so then I'm standing on my big computer here and I just tap the different images in the chat and I'm standing in front of them and I'm able to point and talk about the students' attempts. Now, we're on the other side of the world, literally. Mm. I've got students in Mongolia, Italy, the US, everywhere in the world at the moment. And they've gone from watching the live stream of me and scribbling a drawing in front of them to seeing me pointing to their drawing a moment later, mm. giving a critical assessment of it. And it's like magic, because now what we did was we brought every student to the front of the class. And that's the moment where we realize this is better than a lecture theater mm. because it's easier to get 500 people to the front of the classroom in digital space than it is to walk down the corridor of a big lecture theater. It is easier to get 500 people to the front of the class in a virtual environment. That is really thoughtful. I think you also point out that the use case where the camera is next to the chat line, meaning I want to get a picture in there quickly has been prioritized by Teams, which then allows them to do that. And of course, were Teams to be like Office Lens and recognize the square, de-skew it, clean it up, and yep. then send it even better, turn it into a PDF, there's one better. I, I noticed that my, my children who have now been in Zoom school or Teams school now for uh, yeah. a number of months, uh, one of them said, I feel like all we do anymore is copy web links around. Like yeah. He's constantly making a link and sending a link and copying a link. And he and he's starting to learn, like, I don't feel like we should have taught children about PDFs at this age. I feel like that's a thing we should, you inflict PDFs upon someone. You don't actually teach them to the children. But yeah. those use cases can be hidden. In the example you yeah. gave, no one's thinking about JPEG or HIEC or whatever. They're just saying, hey, hey look at this, doc. Click. And then it's up Bang. on the screen and you're marking it up. Yep. And so what we're talking about is friction. There is so much friction surrounding this educational delivery at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that friction is blocking our ability to communicate easily. 
So I'm talking about all of these things here that are increasing my bandwidth of communication. You know, mm -hmm. digital ink is is a way of communicating. It's easier to draw a diagram of something than to explain it. More space, the ability to point at things, the ability to change camera, it's all about more bandwidth and less friction. And that this is what we need to do to move forward with our ability to communicate in digital space. Indeed. I've seen uh, professors take uh, CDs or I'll take, I'll just wipe off my messy uh, phone here and hold it up and see how I'm reflecting downward and you can see yep. my hand. They'll take mirrors or makeup mirrors or CDs and reflect them to make a kind of airsats uh, overhead projector. That feels like a thing that we should make, a 3D printed, very inexpensive yeah. $2, $1 thing that snaps on a webcam and suddenly I can... I can scribble, or uh, I even have a, a very inexpensive gooseneck lamp, and I gaffer taped a webcam to it. But if I want to change cameras, I have to go device settings, pick the camera. It's just enough friction that I would that do you it. you don't do it. Well, I would do it, you would do it, but I think we'd come up with an automated way to do it. But an average teacher, I think it's asking a lot. They're trying to teach, not exactly. click on things. Yeah. And th so this is where, to me, the frontier of 2020 and the next decade is mm -hmm. about what we can do with integrated systems. Mm -hmm. So if you look at 2010 to 2020, that decade of technology was the age of the killer app. There's, a, there's an app that does everything now. But all of these apps are separated and they can only do what is possible within the sandbox of the data they have. And so now we move forward and we start saying, well, what's possible when you integrate different systems? This is why I'm really interested in teams. So, you know, we, we can take video, for example. You go, okay, well, there are students there and you're talking and you're communicating. What about students who are re-watching the video after? How do we start looking at this video as being something more than a monolithic object, like a VHS tape that you put in the box and hit play? Mm -hmm. How do we start thinking about this as a really rich asset of information? And so, you know, this, this comes back to communication again. We're in Teams. We're in the chat. A student asks a question like, hey, does anybody know what this is? And they didn't watch the lecture that week. Now, my Teams meeting that I had is recorded in stream on Office 365. And machine learning generates a transcript of that. And that transcript is a file that's time indexed against every sentence. Mm -hmm. We can take the question that the student asked, we can get a bot to search that question with natural language processing against the transcript of the video. And then we can, the bot can answer the student straight away and go, I think the answer to your question might be in this week's lecture at 53 minutes and 22 seconds. And then you've got a task module that pops up with a time indexed video going straight to the lecture. So we, we can start integrating all of these different elements. I built that by the way, and it's in, it's in my bot. Um, we can bring all of these different elements together and mash up things, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous or whether they happen via chat or video or today or a week ago. And it's really fascinating. This, I think this is the frontier of the next decade. Now, when you said I, I, I did that, you wrote that, doesn't that make you a programmer? Because we introduced you ah. as not a programmer. No, I didn't, wrote, I didn't write it. My <laughs> developers built it. Ah, I, okay. So you conceived of it. The Lego pieces were available. You spec'd it out. And then yeah. some of your, your interns, your teaching assistant, your developers made that for you. Well, actually, they were friends of mine at a company in Sydney called Antara Solutions. So I, I work with them. I I get them to build my crazy ideas and I know just enough about programming to know what's possible and what isn't possible. I, and that's actually an interesting thing. And one of the things that is the theme of both my YouTube and also what I try to teach people is that it's not about the, the keywords, the functions, the, the little details. It's about the, you know, this ought to work. I should be able to plug that thing into that thing. 
And if we look back at the beginning of this conversation where you showed us how you took X split, I'm using OBS, you took your digital ink, you took your screen, that was the mind of someone who says, you know, this plug really ought to plug into that way, and you're trying, well, that didn't fit, and that, well, hang on, maybe that will fit. You know, this Logitech remote control, I should be able to push buttons, and that, that should make that thing, and then you find a non-fragile way to do it. You've prototyped an integrated system, and now it's on someone to productize it and make it a really integrated yeah. system. And it's an interesting thing about engineering, you know, because when you come in as a first year mechanical engineering student, we start teaching you from around the year 1600, right? <laughs> Newton, the Principia, and we can't actually get anywhere near to today in a four year engineering degree. We get about from the 1600s to about the 1800s, maybe in a four year engineering degree. And so really what an engineering degree is about is understanding the world and realizing that you can learn it, right? You can figure it out. You, you imagine what's possible and not possible. And you start learning how to go and teach yourself or find the resources that you need to move forward. And so that's kind of my position with programming, which is I know enough to figure out what's possible. And then I try and find out whether the tools exist or not. That is uh, very cool. I think that's why we get along because I feel the same way. Like when I went to school, I learned how to program in the 90s and uh, none of those programming languages exist anymore except for C, but I know, how to, I know how to learn. The thing I learned in school was how to learn more and how to, yeah. how to, how to push the limits of what's possible. Uh, that's really cool. Well, thanks a lot for chatting yeah. with me today. Thank you, Scott. It was an absolute pleasure. All right, go ahead and go out there and Google for Dr. David Kellerman. You can see lots of great demos and interviews with him about some of the fun things that he's doing to push the limits with teams. And he and I may just team up next year and try to cause some trouble and do some damage uh, with uh, some plans. of these products. We've got plans. All right, uh, smash that bell, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and we'll see you later.